everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 92 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about heat on your Brother You Are Going Down podcast. I'm Andy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. So back when we first talked about Godfather, so we're talking a year, 18 months now, um, Mm -hmm. you talked about the concept of guy films. We did. And I don't think there's a decent term like this chick flicks, but I don't think Mm -hmm. it's like dude movies. Right. <laughs> or some, you know, something with alliteration or something, maybe. There's there's no decent terms for it. And we talked about what was and what, what wasn't in that kind of genre and style. And you thought Godfather was going to be. This is one I would say is very much a guy movie. That's interesting. I, before I watched it, I would have agreed. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because even Joseph made that comment while we were starting it. He said, this is very much a guy movie. But after watching it, I'm not entirely sure I agree. Okay. But then, as we have previously talked, I don't really think there is such a thing as a guy movie anymore. Yeah. It's just a movie you like or a movie you don't like. Very fair. How come you've never watched this before? I think it's the same answer we've given and just talked about. Well, actually, no, because I didn't even know this movie existed. Okay. Um, It's such a different genre than I would have been aware of that it was not even on my radar. So uh, when you mentioned it, when we talked about Godfather, it was the first time I even knew this movie existed. Okay. Mm. Do you remember I talked about going to the cinema for uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance and not being Mm -hmm. allowed in? Yes. Uh, I saw this in the same cinema with the same friend a few months later, still 14. Did not mention that fact when buying tickets. Good job. (laughs) This was me and Barry Wibbling in Crawley ABC. (laughs) You learned from past mistakes. Good job. Yeah. And I'm just thinking because Eric last week could like say who he saw films with and where he saw them. Mm -hmm. I think I can kind of do the same a number of the times. So I might just start doing that. No, I can't. I cannot do that. Honestly, I think the only movie that I remember seeing in the theater was Titanic. Okay. And and Deadpool 2. Well, yes, of course, Deadpool 2, because I was with you and Catherine, so I will always, always cherish that memory. Nah. Um, (laughs) Heat. So we are in Heat. Heat is a 1995 crime movie written and directed by Michael Mann, starring Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Val Kilmer, and some other people. Mm -hmm. The story is based on the pursuit of a real criminal, also called Macaulay, in the 1960s. It is a remake of Michael Mann's unproduced TV series called LA Takedown. They made a pilot and released it as a TV movie. Heat was successful with both critics and audiences. The film tripled its budget at the box office and critics heralded the intense psychology and performances. And I imagine it had a lot of popularity just up front because Al Pacino and Robert De Niro actually had screen time together. And I think this was the first time that it happened. Yeah, that was absolutely the advertising about it was. Here we have two heavyweights of modern cinema, and they're actually going to be together. Uh, Are you able to put this into a concise synopsis? So it was really, really hard to try and figure out how to do a synopsis. Uh, Again, I looked at IMDb and thought, okay, you can say that about this movie. I looked at Rotten Tomatoes, how they described it. I looked at how Google described it, and it was either one sentence that just did not cover the nuance of this movie or, like, five paragraphs. So here's what I came up with. Okay. Criminal mastermind attention from LAPD Lieutenant Vincent Hanna while trying to plan a final score. Their lives play out in parallel as they engage in an increasingly progressive game of cat and mouse. Yeah, I like it. All right. Mm. It's still... Like, I feel like that leaves out so much of what makes this movie unique and interesting. Mm -hmm. But at its core, it is a crime movie between a criminal and the cop trying to bring him down. Yeah. I I like the point you're making about how he draws the attention of. Because, yeah, it, it is very far into the film where Al Pacino finally goes, hey, who's that guy? Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, and it's it's a nice build to get to that point. Yeah. We'll get into it. <laughs> How were you able to watch this one? This one is only available to rent on Amazon. Okay. Ah, it is available for free on Amazon Prime Video over here. Well, aren't you special? Mm. And I think it might be a director's cut. Like, the, the, the icon for it keeps changing. 
Not the time okay. that I actually sat down and watched it, but at other times it says hate director's cut because I had it in my watch list as a, oh, it's a director's cut. I should watch that at some point. When I went to look, it wasn't director's cut. It has since become the director's cut icon. Now, I could tell nothing different and looking up what Michael Mann did, he didn't really touch it. He did moments of shortening or lengthening sequences. Okay. So how long not... did it end up being? Oh, it's about two hours, 40. Three hours, something. Okay, I was going to say 240 is shorter than the version I watched. See, it now says, Heat, Director's Definitive Edition, 170 minutes. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's how long mine was. Hmm. Interesting. I do not know what he changed. I did not notice anything. It has been a long time since I saw this, I would admit. I, I definitely owned it on VHS. I don't think I've ever owned it on DVD. So okay. it's probably... I've not seen this since 2000, 2002, sometime around then. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm. It's been a while. Mm. Um, We've seen De Niro and Pacino in a couple of things. Um, Do you want to just remind us your experience of them and if you've seen any of Michael Mann's other films? Uh, Michael Mann, I am completely unfamiliar with. This is the only movie he's ever done that I've seen. Okay. And I even looked at his TV credits and I've not seen any of those either. Um, And De Niro and Pacino most recently would be the Godfather films. Um, Right. And really... I've seen more of them in The Godfather than I've ever seen them in anything else at this okay. point. <laughs> okay, Michael Mann also directed Ali, about Muhammad Ali, which is very good, and a film called Collateral. Now, you said there's no uh, Tom Cruise film. You've never seen a Tom Cruise film you didn't like, I think. Yes. Uh, that is a very good film. That okay. is worth watching. It's a good thriller. Yeah, it sounded familiar, so I clicked on it to see if I had seen it and was surprised to find it has Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx. Mm. And and so it was very intriguing, and I'm curious about it now. Okay. Um, we've talked a little bit about similar things that you've experienced and your awareness of them, um, certainly from the Godfather films, and I think we know uh, is not an area you know too well. So um, what did you think of Heat? Did you enjoy this film? I did actually enjoy it. I was super surprised. Okay. Um, especially after you and Eric in our conversation from last week, we're saying that it was long and boring and that you weren't sure what I was going to get out of it. But I really did like it. Um, mm. I, I read Roger Ebert's review of this movie, and I think he summed it up absolutely perfectly for me. Okay. He said, it's not just an action picture. Above all, the dialogue is complex enough to allow the characters to say what they're thinking. They are eloquent, insightful, fanciful, poetic when necessary. They're not trapped with cliches. Of the many imprisonments possible in our world, one of the worst must be to be inarticulate, to be unable to tell another person what you really feel. These characters can do that. Not that it saves them. Oh, he was a great critic, wasn't he? He absolutely oh, was so because he just nailed it in like three sentences. He nailed what this movie is. Um, and, and I'm basically in awe of this movie. I don't think I've ever said that about anything that we've watched, even mm. when I've loved it. I sat down to watch this groaning that it was going to be three hours long. I fully expected mm. to hate it. I thought I was going to struggle through it and have to like do it in two sittings because three hours was just going to be way too much of this guy movie. <laughs> you know yeah and instead i was absolutely riveted and never even noticed the time like it just went by and i wanted to know what was going to happen i was fully invested in both characters like mm-hmm. i really wasn't sure who i wanted to win in this mm. and when the ending happened oh it hurt my heart <laughs> <laughs> i have a bit of a problem with heat I I love this film. I think it's a great film. I think the performance is terrific. It's well written. It's visually very arresting. Uh, It does some really interesting things. I I can't bring myself to say that I enjoy it, though. I think I have a problem, and and we'll see this really when we get to the favourites. There's nothing in this that I can hang off and say, oh, that is a great moment. That thing, that bit of dialogue, that sequence, that shot is spectacular. It elevates the piece. It is all so well done. But it's, there's nothing that I like in it. Well, it is, it's a tough movie. Mm. You know, there's there's no happiness in this movie. Yeah. And I think it, it is hard to say you enjoy something when there's no lightness in it at all. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's probably what you're feeling, though I could be wrong. 
Yeah, because I think like the relationships I, I'm largely unfussed by. They're, mm-hmm. they're not. I, I think the relationships are probably the weakest part. They're they're the bits that I care the least about. But even like the action sequence in the middle is a little bit hard to watch because it's so realistic. Because it's mm-hmm. so oh god, bad things are happening here, and we're not sure who's going to win, who's going to go down, who's going to take a bullet or or shoot a citizen. Mm-hmm. Um. And even the dialogue is really good, but there's no lines that I go, that is a great line. That is either incredibly well written to be something spectacular or something funny or something uh, enjoyable. Okay. So I I think I respect the film to a very high degree. Uh, But it's just, for whatever reason, it's not one that I think of. Where, Where I think of The Godfather and I think of um, the sequence with the horse's head and how cleverly that it, we build up to that moment and Sonny getting shot on the bridge and what they've set up there. There are there are bits in uh, The Godfather, the shooting of Salazzo, um, that are just terrific moments of cinema in general. But there's nothing in this that I would go back to and say, oh, yeah, you have to sit down and watch this because it's so well done. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Hmm. So I did notice that there were a lot of similarities between this and The Godfather. Mm. Primarily, I think, the idea of found family. It was fascinating, just just taking heat on its own, watching um, Daenerys' character and Pacino's character in parallel. Their lives were so very similar, mm. and they both had this group of people that they chose to build their lives around. For Vincent Hanna, it was the people on his team, the men who worked for him, who he was very close to, you know, and so they had that whole dinner party scene where they were all together. And then for Macaulay's side, it was his crew. They were all mm. together. And and none of it was blood family, but both of them were kind of sitting in that patriarchal seat mm-hmm. that both of them sat in in The Godfather for the Corleone family. And I found it fascinating to kind of watch that play out on the screen. Oh, okay, perhaps here's the thing then. Do you not feel a little manipulated into seeing that parallel? The The two scenes are so similar. The film is not even letting us think or, or wonder about whether they're... Oh, yeah, I can see how they're paralleling, you know, this sequence and this sequence. They are the same sequence done with the two of them. Mm-hmm. It's not giving us any nuance of whether you can read that or not, and perhaps that's perhaps that's my issue with it. There's nothing in this that's uh, done with necessarily a deft touch, maybe. Well, where where there might be um, a more confident writer and director, maybe a more adept com- writer and director might do something. I think uh, someone like Christopher Nolan, who we'll talk a bit more about in a minute, but would do something like that just with a little bit more nuance of the parallels they're drawing between people. But very much this film is wanting us to see these guys are two sides of the same same coin. Mm -hmm. And we are going to show you that very much in everything we do. (laughs) They did. I think sometimes it's hard to trust the audience to get what you're trying to say. And so you do kind of hit them over the head with it. Mm. But I felt like it worked in this movie because particularly when you're doing a cops and robbers kind of movie, it's always very delineated that the cops are the good guys and the robbers are the bad guys. And they are not the same ever. Mm. One has virtue. One does not. One has morals. One does not. And in this kind of movie and the, the story that Michael Mann was trying to tell, he needed us to be emotionally invested in both of them. And I think that's why he did it the way that he did. Yeah. And I think that's why I was emotionally invested in both of them. I legitimately, I almost preferred Robert De Niro's character to Al Pacino's character. Okay. Like if he had been able to get off scot-free, I think I would have been really, really happy. Right. And I think the two endings that I would have been good with were either De Niro getting away scot-free. Mm-hmm. Even if he had to be alone, but just not being caught, or if they had killed each other in that final shootout. Okay. (laughs) Those would have been the two endings that I would have been more okay with than just the bad guy got caught and killed. (laughs) 
both alive and happy and free or dead and nothing. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joy or nihilism. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, it is very frustrating. And this is this is partially why they're, they're written so well to make you emote with them. It's very frustrating as you watch De Niro thinking about Wayne Grow. Do I? Don't I? Do I keep going? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, it matters more than anything else. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something we've definitely seen in The Godfather Part 2. That the killing of Fredo is not too different from the killing of Wayne Grow. The I'm going to take care of all business no matter what it costs me. Yeah, I, I think for him, though, it was more about revenge than taking care of business. At least that's the sense that I got. Yeah, I, I think I'm seeing it from the perspective of no one goes against me and my crew. They've okay. done something bad to us, so I, I must uh, take so exactly like you say, some sort of revenge action. But it was the same. I I feel for uh, Michael Corleone to say Fredo has become an enemy of the family, therefore he must be killed. Right. He has done something against me. Um, Do you and- think that he still would have gone against Wayne Grow if he hadn't killed his i cannot remember his name is it Trejo? oh no Trejo. not van Sant. Yeah. is it Trejo? if he hadn't killed Trejo and and anna do you think he would have just let him go hmm. yeah i think so i think that's an, a really important moment of the film because i like that thing of who wasn't there it's clearly Trejo who's betrayed us and then he finds out it goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'm not sure you can do any of it without that because they, they hadn't set up Trejo betraying them at all. Um, right. Which Trejo, played by Danny Trejo, little on the nose. <laughs> a little. Um, so, yes, he probably would have done. I think I think the sort of bubbling need for revenge all the way through would have been set well enough in in his anger against Van Sant and knowing that Wayne Grow was not too dissimilar in some ways, putting him at risk and that's not a thing you do. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What do you think? I think I agree. It's just it's fascinating for me to think about the motivations of characters like that because they're so different mm. from myself. Mm. <laughs> you know, no, you're not um, all that different. <laughs> well, I mean, true. I did just wish them both dead, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and you do wreak havoc on your enemies, so. <laughs> yeah. I am what I am. Um, Yeah. That's a, a, a really interesting question, though. Listeners, let us know. <laughs> um, so the, the relationships, the families, for, for me, uh, I, I don't know whether it's necessarily something that could be gotten rid of, but I don't think it ever comes across quite as well, quite as compellingly as perhaps they might want it to. O- on either side, so Edie and um, Al Pacino's wife, whose name I've now forgotten, did, did either Justine. of them... Justine, thank you. Did, did you emote with either of them? Did you did you wish for more in their relationships? No, not really. I I found myself frustrated with Edie because he was asking her to run away to New Zealand on a second date, essentially. Mm. <laughs> I mean, they were not together long enough for him to actually fall in love with her. And so I struggled with that a little bit. But also at the same time, you know, he's been really lonely for a long time. So maybe he allowed himself to finally feel it. And so it just all came out at one time. I don't know. Mm. Um, the, the stuff with Justine was just so dark. Mm. Like you never saw them being happy together at all. And and so that one just didn't really work for me. I think the one, the relationship that that I did feel the most invested in was Chris and his wife. Yeah. And I, I felt myself being absolutely horrified that she was going to turn him in, even though I understood because she does have a child to look out for. And I was so relieved when she waved him off and warned him. Mm-hmm. Even though essentially I think it, it still means that, that she's walking away and they're not going to be together, but she still didn't take him down. Yeah. And that that was a nice moment. 
Yeah, it's very well done, the whole thing. Because even the police aren't good enough to stop him anyway. Right. Which I could have understand understood the film doing, oh, and then he drives off and gets away. Mm-hmm. But these police people are actually good at their job. They are. Which which is good to see. Like, it's so often you see it. And, and like you say, the police are good and therefore uh, uh, on the side of good, as it were, which means they can't necessarily be good at their job because otherwise they'd be stopping the bad people. Right. It is nice to see police who actually think about it, who actually work the problem and try and get a solution and a, a, a conviction from it. Yeah, it was fascinating to watch um, Vincent come to the realization of what was happening and, and kind of, even though he was always a step behind, really, he he could think like Macaulay did. And so he mm. knew where to go when he was following them and what to do. And he immediately figured out that they had been played when they were yeah. at the refinery. Mm-hmm. And that was just fascinating to watch how his mind worked. And it is different than what you would normally see in a cops and robbers kind of movie. Yeah, very much so. And and that's the stuff that's nice to show that they're two sides of the same coin. The the level of planning detail you see on Neil's side and the uh the, the deduction that Al Pacino puts into it. Uh, I really mm-hmm. appreciate that. And and in some ways that's I, I think why I can like the film so much, because I do like a good heist film. And there is a lot of this that is like several heists going on, because they are obviously pulling off several jobs, so you're getting to see that. And then they're getting to try and understand what those jobs are and how they would go about stopping them. So you've got a sort of anti-heist going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. But then that dude sits down and stops the heist coming off. And that's a shame because that looks like it's going to be good. (laughs) (laughs) So is there anything in this? I I was going to ask you if there's anything you changed because I was expecting you to come out with a, it was kind of dull at times. It was really long. Um, I was going to ask you if there's anything that you would have taken out or changed or modified. Um... Is there anything? I think I would have taken out that whole B plot with Natalie Portman's character. Okay. Because it really, it didn't come to anything. It was just kind of there to show even more, I guess it was trying to give us even more impact on his relationship with his wife that Mm. was ending. Um, But they just kept putting her in weird places and she didn't fit. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I honestly legitimately expected her father to be Robert De Niro's character. (laughs) And then I thought, that doesn't make sense because he would have at least recognized him and he didn't. And and so it just felt completely out of place. And so I don't think the movie would change at all if that was taken out and it would shorten it just a little bit. Mm. And then the the ex-con, okay, they're all ex-cons, but (laughs) the one that they called attention to, uh, Donald Mm. Breeden, the the guy who worked at the diner. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm not sure he really had a point in this, the story either, other than once again trying to show a criminal has a loving relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe that's why he was in it, but he didn't really impact the plot at all. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they made us care about him and then they just killed him off and then he was gone. <laughs> it reminds me of... Uh... What's his name? Scatman Crothers in The Shining, who spends half the film traveling through snow and terrible storms and all this to get back to the Overlook because he mm-hmm. has heard Danny shining and in trouble. And then he gets there and gets an axe in his chest from Jack Nicholson. Right. It's got a little bit that same thing. Like, uh, oh, why have we been following this guy? Right. <laughs> um, the, the two things you've just said, those are the two things that make me feel they didn't change enough from what they were going to do in the TV show. Those are both things that would have worked following them for several episodes. And then when they finally come to like the end of season and they're both heavily involved and it's like, oh, there is tragedy going on here on both sides. Mm -hmm. And it would have been quite interesting to see those characters interacting and building up to that stage. Yeah. Uh, But yet you could erode, erode them from the film and not much has changed. Yeah, because they really didn't give us enough of her relationship with him to understand why she would have gone to his hotel room to kill herself. Mm. Like, obviously she had a better relationship with him than she did with her own father. She was terrified of her own father, Mm -hmm. but 
I mean, they, they shared screen time only a few times. And I think, I think you're right. They probably were trying to do something that would have been more fleshed out in the TV show that they just didn't have time to do in the movie. Mm. Yeah. I, I, and the, I think the film tries to make a point about, oh, she went to his apartment because it was cry for help. And she, she loved him and trusted him so much, something like that. Mm-hmm. But that did not feel like a cry for help. Like, they, they go really hard on the, she has sliced open both arteries in a very right. vicious way. This is a girl who did not expect to wake up. So right. she went somewhere. She knew she could be alone for a while because he was always out working. It's got right. more of that vibe to it, which is, it's dark. It is very dark. What about you? Were there parts that, that you would have changed? I, I think the two you've said, um, I think I'd agree with. Uh, the other one that stands out, again, it feels a bit like something that would work better as a, a sort of season-long arc, is Wayne Grow, particularly with the prostitute. Mm, yeah. Um, and that's uh, they make the point that this is, I think, like the fourth time this has happened, and it's going to be the mm-hmm. same guy doing this. And I feel, actually, his impact would have been better had he appeared later to Van Zandt and saying, oh, yeah, I know this guy, I can help you against him. Because we would have forgotten about him by that point. But because right. we've revisited, we've had both the scene with him and the prostitute and then seen Al Pacino visiting the, the prostitute's murder scene, we're, we're sort of reminded of his story and expecting it to come to more. I, I would have yeah. liked to have left him just off and then he comes back and it's like, oh, it's that guy. Yes, that's what's come and turned around. Right. I think it felt like they wanted to do more with his character than they did because... I'm not sure why else they started that thread of he may be a serial killer. Mm. If they weren't going to do anything with that. Yeah. I mean, it got another woman in this film. (laughs) Two with Rachel, because it's a film that needs more women. (laughs) On at least like one on the crew and one on the police something. Yeah. I mean, but it was 1995. Yeah. Um, I, so I've been trying to watch 365 films this year. Um, Mm -hmm. and when I watch a film, I put a note on Twitter about what number it is and how I've rated it. Um, and I said, I I think I gave this a nine out of 10. This is a a great film. Just, I can't quite bring myself to call it a perfect, like 10 out of 10. Right. And my friend Cy said, this is a moment of rare alignment between the two of us. Um, I think I've said before, he does not like his sci-fi action fantasy type superhero films right which i do quite like and i am not so fond of my you know gritty thrillers um and we have each taken the other to see several of them over the years but he said this is a moment of rare alignment and he did give me some feedback on it his thoughts on it he said this is the complexity and depth of plot are enjoyable but the moral aspects are more troubling you quickly reach a point of not liking anybody i think that's the same sort of thing we we were talking about earlier it's there's no one in this that you go, oh, I can't wait to see them again. I can't wait to see more of their plot. You're interested in the heist and the mm-hmm. criminality of going on and trying to stop the criminals. But the people doing it, there's nothing there to say, yeah, go, Al Pacino. <laughs> You're so likable in this. <laughs> I kind of thought Robert De Niro was pretty likable. Yeah, exactly. That's the closest we come. Yeah. And almost because he's a bit of a kind of tabula rasa blank slate you can imprint on him. And because he comes across as so honourable, he is a criminal, but he does mm-hmm. right by the people around him. He has a code that he lives to, and he does, you know, not the worst bad things. He steals from people who can afford to be stolen from. Right. Yay, go the criminals. Yeah. And he's annoyed when one of his crew shoots someone. Yeah, I was surprised um, by the the shooting at the beginning um, in the the armored car heist. Mm. I wasn't surprised that Wayne Grow went rogue and killed somebody just because he was a jerk anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was surprised when they were given permission to kill everybody else. Although it made sense once Al Pacino got there and was examining the crime scene and he said, well, once they shot one, they couldn't leave witnesses. Mm. But I was disappointed in Robert De Niro's character at that point because my expectation of Robert De Niro, even as a criminal is one of honor. (laughs) I don't know why, but it is. And so I was pleasantly surprised to see him kick Wayne Grow off the crew and, you know, essentially want to kill him, try to kill him, but Mm. 
instead he got away. Mm. Um, that worked in my, I guess it reinforced my idea that he does have honor even as a criminal. Yeah. So talking Robert De Niro, the the sequence at the, at the end finishes with him. He is the one who was shot. And he is the one who's done bad things. And we have seen Al Pacino be heroic in saving uh, young Natalie Portman. Mm -hmm. That's the one bit I can actually point to and criticize and say, I wish that was done better. The the shooting at the very end. And, and it's it's you know, quite thrilling. The soundtrack may or may not help it too much. Um, but, but it is really good with their lights coming up and them sort of looking around corners and trying to hunt each other down. It's very well done up to that point. All the way through the film, everything that happens is almost down to a moment of luck, a moment of attention or inattention. Mm -hmm. Robert De Niro is not caught because the guy sits down and he is strong enough to say, no, we walk away from this now. Um, the Wayne Grove gets away because the police happen to go past at that moment. So they can't go and shoot him right then. Right. Um, the, the heist in the bank itself, they get managed to get a lucky tip to go and get them. And as he's getting into the car, Val Kilmer sees two guys with guns, so they start the firefight. Otherwise, they would have been in the car and completely caught. Right. The whole film sort of hinges on these moments of... Oh, skill is not the right word, but it, but moments of a, a, attention or inattention. And then at the very end, it's just... He notices the shadow and he turns and shoots him dead centre straight away. Because it's absolute skill. I, I almost wish there was just some... Something to continue that thread of luck going for or against you. See, and I read it as still following in that luck slash attention to detail thing. Mm. Because De Niro was waiting for the lights to come back up because he knew that Al Pacino was standing out there and the lights would show him exactly where. And so he was trying to take advantage of the situation mm. and he didn't think about the fact that the lights would give him a shadow which would give him away and so i felt like that shadow was kind of luck for al pacino's character and if he hadn't noticed it he would have gotten shot he just happened to notice that that shadow was there and so he was able to shoot first i just feel everything about it had been their skill on both sides is so high yeah. it's it's completely random things Okay. That sort of happen, but in this, it's Robert De Niro does something wrong and gets right. caught from well, it, and just I, I don't know a better way to do this. I could not improve this myself without sitting down for probably several hours in a room and going a bit nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's why I expected them to shoot each other. Mm. Yeah, that was my expectation, and so when when De Niro did not get a shot off at Al Pacino, I was legitimately surprised. Mm. I yeah, almost called I'd him agree. Michael right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd agree as well, actually. Because it, it it feels like an actual victory where all the way through it would have been a score draw right. between them. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I said we would talk Christopher Nolan. I think, I think mm -hmm. this is a, a good point to do this. I had never clicked. Uh, and there are things about how Nolan used this film as, as some of his basis, but I had never clicked. Mm -hmm quite how much he'd used this as his basis for The Dark Knight and quite how much he's basically ripped off to the extent of casting William Fickner in the um, bank heist at the opening of The Dark Knight. But there's so much in the similar, certainly in the way the city is used and portrayed, but just in the, in the way a lot of the action happens, in a way that a lot of the dialogue happens, and even the relationship between Pacino and De Niro is not too dissimilar to the way they do the relationship between Batman and the Joker, even um, the sequence where uh, Al Pacino and De Niro have that coffee and they talk to each other about, didn't you want a different life? What's your life like? Okay, this is my code. This is how I work. It feels so similar to the uh, interrogation sequence between Batman and the Joker, where he talks about, I have one rule and you're a menace to this city. And it, obviously they are the substance of them is different but it feels like he has used this film so much as the basis for the dark knight did, mm -hmm. did you notice any of that did that pick up to you at all i did not notice it at all 
Um, but I also haven't seen The Dark Knight as frequently as you have. I've only seen sure. it the one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did go and look up, you know, I think I did a quick Google search for Michael Mann and Christopher Nolan, and I found frequent references to this, mm. um, including a video that someone had cut together of the Dark Knight, scenes from the Dark Knight juxtaposed with scenes from Michael Mann movies. Right. Um, not just this one, but other ones as well. Okay. And it, there's definitely something there. I mean, and, and Nolan has even come out and said that he mm. definitely was inspired by Michael Mann and, and that he used a lot of Michael Mann's stuff when he was doing The Dark Knight and, and other movies. So there is a lot. There, I, I'm not sure I can just say this is inspired by. Is, is there a difference between inspired by and I ripped it off? And which which did Nolan do? <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly for me it's tough to say i think i think you could say the bank heist was ripped off because that was almost shot for shot the same mm. and it was exactly i mean it was a bank heist it's not even like he changed the context it was we're gonna rob a bank and it's exactly the same some of the other stuff i think is different enough because the the context is different the subject matter is different that i can see it being more inspired hmm. and i think at the end of the day christopher nolan wasn't trying to steal michael mann's work i think he really was trying to say michael mann does really good work and i want to i don't know i mean imitation is the highest form of flattery yeah, intent goes a long way. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that, that's what I'm trying to say is intent goes yeah. a long way. I don't think he was trying to say, this is this great movie that I did. He's saying, I want to make a great movie similar to another great movie that's out there. And so I'm going to use some of these elements, mm -hmm. maybe. Got it. Maybe I'm being too forgiving. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I say, I just had not ever, I think, really clicked quite how similar they were. And watching it, I was just like, wow. Wow, yeah, there's a lot in here. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously since this came out, we've had 15th and 20th anniversaries of it. Um, I did find a, a, a number of articles where, where the actors and the crew did talk about the making of it and some of their thoughts on it. Um, there was one interesting one. I wanted to ask you, Al Pacino, he is quite wild in this at times. I think we'll, we'll talk about more about that in detail in a minute. But do you think subtextually, because obviously we're not presenting it on screen, but do you think either Al Pacino or the character are on drugs during this film? When I just saw that question on our notes, my answer was no. Okay. But then I Googled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the the answer is, I think, yes, because Michael Mann intended it to be, but he took the drugs out of the script. And then Al Pacino has also come out and said that he played the character as if he was on drugs, so... Yeah, the phraseology of that was a bit strange. The the way he played the character is a bit like, yeah, no, I was coked off my head making that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's quite gone that far, but... <laughs> I. Who knows? I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Who knows? I wondered whether you read it that there was something else like that going on or whether it is just Vincent... In again, trying to show that they're two sides of the, of the same coin, but one ends up this really emotional, really sort of passionate guy when he's talking, and the other one is very internal and very low key when he does stuff. Yeah, I think that's how I read it. Mm. Um, I was mostly enamored with watching Al Pacino have emotion. Okay. Since I hadn't seen that in in the Godfather movies, right. Um, and so it didn't even occur to me that, that it was possible that some of his outbursts and reactions to things were drug related. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah, because in, in the Godfather films, I did uh, the episodes that we did about them, I did mention about Pacino shouting. That becomes a Pacino thing. You can mm -hmm. see it here. Every other scene, he has a moment of shouting at someone. Yes, he does. <laughs> but it's not all shouty. It's not all shouty. Um this, I think, segues us. Are there favorite things in this? Are there, are there things like that that you particularly enjoyed? Um, well, yeah. I mean, like we were just talking about, just Pacino having emotion. Just because my experience of him so far is the Godfather, and he's got that quiet rage and stoicism thing going mm -hmm. on. And there was none of that here. De Niro had it, but 
Pacino did not. Um, and I liked him, you know, like doing the wide eyed, like arm wavy, shouty <laughs> things just because it was so different. I really did like that. I mean, um, it's, it's slightly awful, but the moment where he's like, she's got a great ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your head is all the way up it. <laughs> yeah. He is. He, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it is. It really is. And it, it looks almost ad libbed. Because it looks like he's about to say big or beautiful or something. And then he goes with great. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if he was just told to go and do something. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Um, It's really funny because um, I was tweeting that I was watching this movie. Or I was going to tweet that I was watching this movie. And so I did a quick search for um, a GIF, Mm -hmm. GIF, whatever. And that was the one that came up most often. And I hadn't gotten there yet in the movie. And I was like, I wonder what the context of that is. <laughs> After the job. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was funny. It was interesting. Um, I think my very favorite part of this movie was the coffee shop scene. Okay. Just because getting to see them on screen together right. was pretty spectacular. Watching these two men who are very obviously great actors. Um just just do this and and watching them play off of each other and you could see the similarity between the two of them so so much but also the differences it it wasn't just like you were watching carbon copies of each other talking to each other Hmm. but at the same time you got those great lines like you know i i'm not gonna back down me neither this is who i am me too i don't Hmm. remember exactly what they were but it was very clearly that these two men are very, very similar, but it was fascinating to watch them together yeah. and to watch that kind of quiet respect that they had for one another. I, I think hands down, it was the best scene in the whole movie. Yeah. Uh, and I think I especially like, because it's Al Pacino tracks him down and, and says, let's go for coffee. So that there was a, a, a little bit of a thing of he's got one over on him by, by being able to track him down like that. But then mm-hmm. De Niro just disappears and his crew disappears. Right. So, so again, we that's a nice way of showing us, okay, they're both able to do the same thing without mm, hammering the point back. Right. Hmm. And um, De Niro had a scene that I thought he perfectly nailed um, when he was on the phone with Van Zant after he had mm-hmm. sent people essentially to kill his crew and not give him the money. Um, he's on the phone with him and he, he says something like, you know, it, it doesn't matter – you know, there's nobody on the phone or it doesn't matter if I'm having a conversation because he said there's a dead man on the other end of this line. Yeah, and it was cold. so scary, mm. so like serious. I mean, the level of rage that it takes to, to be that controlled mm-hmm. is pretty incredible. And I, I thought he nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, enough yeah. that Van Sant started sleeping in his office <laughs> yeah. and didn't leave. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I feel weird saying that I have favorite moments from this movie just because it is so dark and, and so serious, Mm -hmm. but the performances were, were pretty spectacular. Um, I know you've said that you can't really enjoy it, but are there things that, that stood out to you that, that you either did like, or that you respected more than others? So, so this question was, was what got me thinking about okay why is there nothing that comes to mind i don't really want to talk about the shootout because it's okay but there's other sort of action sequences that i prefer and and i don't really want to talk about the coffee sequence because you know it's so famous in and of itself i think it's lost a little bit of its uh meaning almost yeah this was the scene between robert de niro and al pacino um but there was one scene that came to mind that I'm like, actually, no, I enjoy that scene. I enjoy it for several reasons. And that's the first time we see them going to shake down Albert. Mm-hmm. The guy in the garage that has weird stuff going on and everyone runs out. Because <laughs> Al Pacino, and that's one of the first times we see Al Pacino being big and grand. And he's right. going through that. And he's walking in and he's shouting at everyone and just, like you say, arms up and wide and gesticulating and eyes wide open. Um, I, I love his partner who comes in there who talks about, like, you know, I was paging you all yesterday. I hate paging. <laughs> it's like, oh, you made him mad. You made him page. <laughs> I like that. Right. Um, 
and that's where you get the, the one of the first moments of Al Pacino really shouting like this guy is giving him all sorts of excuses why he can't help him and he's just screaming at him give me all you got give me all you got <laughs> and it's like he is going to you know turning it up to 11 to do that mm-hmm. but then when the guy finally gives up like okay my cousin's coming into town he's going to give you some you have to meet him at 2 a.m. at this club blah blah and he's like you know you're going to be there and this guy starts giving him excuses about why he can't be there. I've got things to do. I can't be there. And he just leans in. He's like, hey, 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 hey. Be there. And walks off. And it's, mm-hmm. I think, the same thing you're saying about De Niro. Actually, when he goes quiet, and we definitely said this with The Godfather, when he when he goes really low and he makes you listen because he's commanding attention, it's so much better than the shouting and the presence uh, of the earlier moments. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I really enjoyed that scene. I, I quite I quite like the follow up where he does go and meet the cousin, because mm-hmm. um, again he's in a situation where he might not be in control, but he absolutely acts like he is. They are there at his whim, right? <laughs> Giving him information that he wants. Doesn't right. really care if they get anything out of this. Exactly. Mm. He was big man on campus. <laughs> yeah, the the character. I think the the writing certainly of those two characters is very well done. They are really good, well put together characters. Um, that I can definitely speak to and say it yeah. is something I can uh, enjoy in this film. Okay. Ooh. I think it's interesting that you said that you didn't want to pick the coffee shop because it is the scene. It is the famous scene that everybody always talks about. Because I think that is the joy for me of coming to these movies for the first time because that's something I didn't know you know like I don't know that people have been talking about the scene for the Mm. last 25 years 30 years however long it's been Um, and that's fascinating I love it yeah like I say it was the really big thing when it was released it was like oh they've actually got these two in the same film at the same time and and probably over the years they had been up for the same parts a number of times I mean definitely we said it with the godfather they were Mm -hmm. um but they'd almost been competitors and and kind of by this point it's actually no you can have the two guys doing the same thing together or or have slight differences between them right um sadly neither yeah. of them i think have anything particularly great since this you know robert de niro just started doing comedy after comedy which woof. yeah yeah <laughs> i did think it's interesting i read that um michael mann always intended for pacino and de niro to do these parts and mm. they were never even offered to anybody else nice good so mm. all right well is there anything else that we need to talk about heat one question on it for you okay uh we obviously we've talked all the way through about pacino and de niro do you think one of them is the protagonist and one is the antagonist do you think there is someone whose point of view we are more supposed to be cheering as the hero that's a really good question. <laughs> I think the movie doesn't know which one is the protagonist because the ending would lend you to believe that Al Pacino's character is because he's the one who comes out on top. Mm. But I found, I felt like we actually got more screen time following Robert De Niro. Okay. And, and maybe we didn't. Um, it just may be that he is the one that I related to more. And so he's the one that I cared about more, which is possible. So for me, Robert De Niro was the protagonist, and he's the one that I wanted to win. So I don't know. I'm not sure if the movie knew or if I'm just Yeah, it's, very, it's a very weird. fair point. Because mm. Pacino is trying to stop De Niro. De Niro mm-hmm. is the one who has the goal, who has a thing he is actively trying to do, which is take these scores. Right. Pacino is is his goal is to work against him, right? Hmm. And according to How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich, that would mean that Robert De Niro is the protagonist. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. You can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. We are 100% funded by listeners like you through our Patreon page. Any amount you can give, even $1 a month, gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and develop new shows. To find out more, visit patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. And don't forget to visit the homepage, eloquentgushing.com, to keep up to date with the latest news announcements and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. 
And we'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we will talk about Halloween favorite Hocus Pocus with Catherine Vos, who has never seen it from our Worth the Calories podcast. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And I am alone. I am not lonely. Pop Culturally Deprived is an eloquent gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at eloquentgushing.